Hello. Essay here again. Have you ever heard of the so-called anti-oil movement? Well, I've heard scuttlebutt about it, but I didn't think much about it until I saw a very crazy, ridiculous video. It took place in uh, England, uh, near a place called Portland. And no, not that Portland. And uh, in an area called Dorset. Yeah, I think it was Dorset. But anyway, it showed a bus. Uh, not a school bus or anything like that, just a regular charter bus. Trying to get from point A to point B. And these people, all wearing orange vests, sitting there on the road trying to stop the bus. And no, they didn't want to get on the bus to catch a ride. No, they were trying to stop the bus. And what, the, did the bus stop? No. The bus just kept going. And did the people get run over? Well, let's just say this. Uh, Self-preservation always trumps uh, valor. And the people got up and got out of the way. Well technically not right away they got up and then they tried to do their own best version of Superman trying to hold the bus back but of course when you have a big old hunk of a metal <laughs> weighing at least five or six tons and you have like a handful of crazy people trying to stop it well you know who's gonna win that fight and eventually these stop the oil people basically waved the white flag and gave up and let the bus go on its, on its way. And the funny thing is, this is not the first time this has happened. In fact, this is happening a lot. And not just uh, in England, but happening in France, Italy, Germany, and even in Washington, D.C. In fact, there's a great incident that was filmed where these people blocked uh, one of the main highways going in uh, D.C. and wouldn't let the people go through. And, the pe and they totally stopped traffic. It was so crazy. And one guy lost his job because of these knuckleheads. Yeah, he was, he, they made him late for work. And because of that, he lost his job. And I'm thinking, well, damn, maybe he shouldn't have been working there if his boss didn't appreciate the fact that it wasn't his fault why he was late. But anyway, the point of this video is that you would say that environmentalism is all well and good. I mean, everyone wants clean air, clean water. I mean, I can't think of anyone who wants dirty air, dirty water. Because back when I was a wee little kid, when Earth Day first became a thing, they taught us in class about how bad things were. Indeed, they showed us pictures of Pittsburgh in the 1950s and how the air was so dirty that people had to turn on their headlights just to see, uh, uh, see through traffic at high noon. So, yeah, there was a time when <laughs> pollution was pretty bad. But guess what? That was then, this is now. And the pollution... Okay, we still have litter bugs, but it's not so bad, not as it was back in the past. And yet, these eco-environmentalist types, they are running around like their hair is on fire, thinking that the world's going to end in less than 10 years if they don't stop fossil fuels altogether. And now, of course, you say, where to get that idea? Uh, from uh, AOC, you know, Cortez? No, I don't think so. Because long, long ago, back when I was a wee little kid, uh, Whitworth and Bernstein, yeah, you remember those two guys, they were in a parking lot with Deep Throat, and Deep Throat told them a very dirty little secret. They told them, if you want to find out who is at the heart of the Watergate conspiracy, follow the money. Who's paying for it? You find out who's paying for it, you find out who did it. Well, I did a little snooping too. And I was wondering, 
who's paying for this stop the oil outfit and guess what the information was sitting there on the computer the whole time and who's paying for it if <laughs> you you're gonna love this this is crazy the people who are paying for this outfit which has been around that long officially they only been around for about over a year since 2022 but they get their funding primarily from the Getty family and you say you mean the Getty oil family you know, <laughs> yeah those people and you say oh, why are they uh, paying uh, uh, these people run around blocking highways to prevent people just to get to work that's a very good question no answers but we do know one thing is not J. Paul Getty no 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 it's not him he's, he's been long dead yeah in fact it's uh, one of his uh, great grandkids I think her name is Aileen Getty now you say why is she doing it I don't know maybe when I see her next time I go to the uh, Starbucks I'll ask her like I go to Starbucks I mean six six fifty nine for a mocha latte vente forget it ain't happening and then but they're not the only but she's not only who's paying for these people you know who else is paying for it this guy who goes by the curious name of Dale Vince and you say who the F is that well according to the computer he's some kind of English type industrialist who runs a company called are you ready Ecotricity and you say apparently this guy can't spell ecological electricity yeah I know he's just being clever and you say well, what does this company do simple it makes uh, <laughs> Uh, it makes investments in so-called e economical electricity and then it begins to make sense you say oh so what's really going on here is is that these anti-oil people are being paid by the eco energy or what they call the green energy crowd yeah that makes sense and you say how does that make sense well back here in California there was a famous uh, uh, transportation line called the red line and no I'm not talking about the current that line this predates it in fact it's before my time but it was basically a private uh, transit service and it had trains that ran all over the city of LA and then it went out of business you know why well according to the official record it went out of business because the company was superseded by what was later referred to as the rapid transit service and it couldn't compete with rapid transit which was a uh, a, a service set up by the city of LA and they went out of business but when I was growing up uh, my mother used to ride the old red line she told me that the real reason they went out of business was because of General Motors Standard Oil and Firestone tires and you say really how because the red line when it was in its heyday was so successful that very few people needed to buy cars and if you don't buy cars you can't sell them gasoline so those three companies got together and said let's kill these guys and apparently they were successful and therefore no more uh, red line therefore people had to go out and buy cars from General Motors tires from Firestone and then uh, gasoline from the oil company it's a good business uh, uh, paradigm if you can get away with it. Now let's jump forward to the present day. You have a bunch of people in the green energy business that clearly want to increase their market share, but then you have these old school oil industries, Chevron, uh, Royal Dutch.
Fiat, Shell, Exxon, Mobil in the way. So what do you do? You put them out of business. Put them out of business, guess what? You're the last one standing and everyone flocks to your service and you provide them with energy resources. Good paradigm if you can get away with it. That is, if you can get away with it. But so there's one small problem. Anyone who is familiar with so-called green energy knows that it's not ready for prime time. And you say, but what do you mean? We got windmills and solar panels all over the place. Yeah. And anyone who's smart who will tell you that the problem with windmills and solar panels is that it's environmental base. It's transitory. In other words, the windmill only works when the wind is blowing. And I don't mean, you know, sticking your eating a good bunch of beef and bean burritos from Taco Bell and going up and sticking your ass next to the windmill and just letting it rip. I mean, that's not going to work. No, not that kind of wind. No. And solar panels only work when the sun is shining. And you say, well, the sun shines every day. Well, unless, of course, there's a, a, a rainstorm, then the sun is not shining at all. And indeed, back when I was a wee little kid, we have one full month of just unending storms rolling through California. And I hated it because I had to go to school in that rainstorm every day. Hated it. Just hated it. And my mother, she gave me an umbrella at the time. And this was a, an umbrella. No, I was a wee little kid. The umbrella was as big as I was. And it was totally, you know, impractical but all during that month we had of rainstorms <laughs> it was just a cloudy day every day not a never saw the sun at all now imagine you're in your house and you got solar panels and you are subjected to 30 days of nothing but rain and storms and cloudy skies how's that going to work out for you and then, of course, some of you smart people say, well, oh, hey, I got that Tesla battery in my basement that switches on when the power goes down. Yeah, so there's one small problem, and even Musk will tell you this. That battery only works when the sun is shining in the daytime, which charges the battery up. That battery has only an infinite amount of power. And when that battery runs down to zero, guess what? All the lights in your house go out. So, yeah. And then, of course, you will say, well, uh, what are we supposed to do? One word. Nuclear. And now, of course, this is where things get really goofy. The eco people, the green energy people, they hate nuclear power. Why? I have no idea. Now, of course, they'll probably say, oh, what about Chernobyl? What about Three Mile Island? What about Fukushima? And I'm thinking, okay, that's three nuclear disasters. And how long have they had nuclear power stations? Since the 1950s? I mean, that's like, what's almost 80 years? Okay, a little more than 70 years. And you know how many nuclear power stations there are? <sighs> well... I don't know them after I talk my head, but I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure it's a lot more than three. And yet these people don't want nuclear power. And yet smart people, people who really know this stuff, will tell you when it comes to various forms of energy we've had throughout human history, whether it be human power, a water-based power, you know, for example, the Archimedes screw. I mean, look it up, Archimedes screw, look it up. Uh, horsepower, you know, no, 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 Mr. Ed sitting in the damn uh, barn, you know, feed a little hay and then take it out and hit your wagon to it and you, and you go across country. Yeah. And of course, finally coal and then finally oil based. I mean, yeah, all of those energy sources, they were all basically, uh, for the most part, storable. They were reliable and they were readily available. But then, of course, nuclear came along. And nuclear, smart people, is pound per pound more efficient, 
than all those other forms of energy that ever exist before, including windmills and solar panels. And yet these people don't want them to do it nuclear. It, it just makes no sense. And, wait for it, nuclear is non-polluting. And you say, wait a second, what about all that nuclear waste? Well, that was the old school nuclear power stations. The newer ones, the so-called light water reactors, they have very little nuclear waste. And, wait for it, a few smart people spoke about how there's a new form of nuclear power station that no one hasn't actually put in, implemented yet. It's called, I think it's called a thorium reactor. I, I, I may not be pronouncing it right, but I think it's pronounced thorium. It's basically a nuclear isotope. Supposedly, it has all the power of a regular nuclear power station, but none of the nuclear waste afterwards. And a lot of smart people said if they start building these thorium-based reactors, you could have nuclear power for decades and not have any waste at all. And yet these green energy people saying, no, no way, no nuclear. And in the meantime, you have a lot of <laughs> jurisdictions who are setting up these windmills and setting up these solar panels knowing full well that these things only work when the sun is shining wind is blowing and indeed right now as we speak out there in new jersey the state of new jersey is planning on setting up a whole pile of windmills right out there on the coastline so when people go out there uh for their damn uh labor day holiday or uh, memorial day holiday and they're gonna, uh, sitting on the beach instead of seeing a nice white beach and all that ocean out there gonna see a bunch of windmills sitting out there as plain as day and wait for it uh, apparently uh, these windmills have been causing deaths of whales now exactly what's going on there I don't know yet but I've seen the dead whales they washed up on shore and Jesse Waters, you know that goofy guy from Fox News, he he's, he reports the story. And he's talked to some people who are basically conscientious about, you know, whales. Said that, yeah, the people who are building the damn windmills out there on the Jersey Shore, uh, they're causing the whale deaths. Exactly how? I forgot exactly how. But they said there's something to do with uh, sonar and some other deal. But yeah, they're causing whale deaths. And yet the state of New Jersey don't seem to give a shit. However, there's a great documentary. Uh, it's called uh, The Planet of Man. Uh, because uh, the brother who made Fahrenheit 9-11. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name at the moment. Big Boy. Yeah, he made, he helped produce that film, and they talked to a bunch of people about windmills and solar panels, and it's a great document. You need to look it up. And they said the problem with windmills and solar panels is that uh, they they don't last very long. And why? Uh, because the way they're designed. No, because windmill, for example, has that big dynamo in there, and they said that dynamo is only good for five years. And they said the problem is that when they build these huge windmill farms, and we're talking huge, I mean those windmills are on top of a tower that's about 100 meters in the air. That's pretty high. And therefore the companies, remember these are private companies that run these windmill farms, they for the most part, when the windmill finally grinds down, the dynamo starts work, stops working, they just leave it up there. Oh, they'll take the, the, the propeller off, but they leave the damn thing up there. And then they say, why don't you just simply take the dynamo and put a new dynamo in? Why? Because these people decided that it's cheaper just to build a new windmill than to maintenance the old one. And you say, what? Yeah. That's what I thought was crazy too. And indeed, in the documentary, they showed where there was a windmill farm abandoned and these towers are sitting there all corroded and rusty just sitting there rotting away 
<laughs> and in the meantime, the company that built it, they built a new windmill wind farm down the road a ways. Ridiculous. And with solar, and solar panels, it's even worse. Because solar panels, uh, apparently they're only good for about 10 to 20 years, tops. And you say, but wait a second, don't they use solar panels on uh, satellites in space? Yeah. But the funny thing about those satellites is that they're out there in space where it's a vacuum. Don't have to worry about wind or weathering. But here on the Earth, yeah, when, when you have a solar panel on your roof, it's subjected to wind and weathering and occasionally, you know, stupid kids, you know, with BB guns shooting at it. <laughs> and over time, the wind and weathering wears those things out. Just wear them out. And in the same documentary, they went out to the California desert, I think it was somewhere near Ojai, and they showed a solar panel farm that had been dismantled and abandoned. Why? Because what happened was that the solar panel farm was set up by a co private company. Initially it ran, but then when it was time to replace the solar panels, the company didn't have the money to replace them. So they sold the solar panel farm to another company. Another company looked at it and they decided, you know what, it's going to cost us too much money to replace all those solar panels and so just shut down the whole thing. And they spoke to the people in that documentary about this abandoned solar panel farm. And they and the filmmakers went out there because this place was abandoned. There was nobody there. And it was just, just like something out of Mad Max, you know. It was just derelict. Nobody there. The solar panels just covered in dust and debris. Some of them actually had fallen off the pedestals and landed on the ground and smashed. Waste. Total waste. And that's the worst thing about solar panels and windmills farms is that they take up a lot of real estate. I mean, you talk to anyone who knows this stuff, they'll tell you. An old school... Uh natural gas power station takes up a very small footprint and yet if you wanted to have a solar panel farm or a windmill farm that would produce the same electricity it takes up a huge real estate uh, easily a, a several, several hundred acres crazy and yet these green energy people don't seem to care because in the end it's money for them So then, what does that mean when it comes to the Just Stop Oil movement and Equal Alliance, another, you know, you know uh, anti-fossil fuels company, which is, wait for it, is also funded by the same Getty family. Yeah, that is kind of weird, isn't it? It's all basically about market share. In other words, Just Stop Oil is a con game. Yeah, that's right, children. These people don't really care about the environment. They just care about their market share. Apparent, because you can look it up. Uh, because uh, according to the computer, uh, eco this e e e extinction rebellion. Uh, that they're not only funded by uh, that Getty woman. They're also uh, funded by uh, Trevor Nielsen. He's some kind of American entrepreneur. Uh, he controls some outfit called Waste Fuel, another e-energy company. And wait for it, it's also uh, funded by uh, uh, Oh man, I, I lost his name. But I saw his name before. Yeah, the guy was a hedge fund manager. And, uh, yeah, I had it on the computer and I, and I don't see it. But, yeah, some uh, hedge fund manager uh, is also uh, funding. Oh, here he is, right here. Yeah, and Anthony, uh, Christopher, oh, Sir. Christopher Anthony 
uh, Hoyt, I think that's pronouncing his name. Yeah, H O yeah H O H N. Yeah, he runs some uh, hedge fund called K C M G. Yeah, uh, he's one of the people who funds Extinction Rebellion. So yeah, it's all about money. It's all and it's all a con game. And what about the foot soldiers to these uh, these eco uh, terrorist types or eco protests, whatever? Uh, do they know what's really going on? That's a very good question. No answers. Then again, I remember back during the bad old days of the Bolsheviks, and they used to have this phrase called useful idiots. Basically, people who were supporting them, not really knowing what they, the Bolsheviks, were all about. Well, I think that's probably what's going on with these people out there in the middle of the highway trying to stop a bus and nearly getting run over in the process. They're useful idiots for these hedge fund people, these green energy business people, and they don't really have a clue what's really going on. They're basically being played. Will they wake up and smell the cat food and realize they're being played for saps? Maybe, maybe not. But we do know this thing. <laughs> uh, people don't like these people. Indeed, the last survey they had in Britain where they asked a bunch of people, what do you think about Extinction Rebellion? And only 19% of the population said, yeah, double plus good. Well, these guys are all right in our phone book. While everybody else said, ah, these people are full of shit. Get them out of here. <laughs> so yeah despite their tactics and their methods they're not making any friends nope so I guess in the long term uh, these uh, these uh, eco, pro eco protesters they're probably not going to succeed they're just making people mad at them and as for these business people who are bankrolling them hmm I think at a certain point I think they might pull their funding especially if some of these hedge funds realize that they're losing too much money funding these damn radicals in the street and they must just pull the rug out from underneath them and I think when that day comes uh, you'll see these protests just disappear because remember what Gus Grissom famously said when he was asked rhetorically what makes a rocket fly into space and he said funding no bucks no buck rogers and that also applies to these protests no bucks no protesters so yeah when the money dries up those protests just going to disappear Well, that's it for me, and that's my opinion.